Well, hello, everybody. Again, um, I am here with Dr. Debbie Hamilton, uh, who's been a long term friend and colleague and has been in our state for quite a while. Um, I will formally introduce her in just a minute or two. Just a little background. If you if this is your first time tuning in, you can find us um, on YouTube at my YouTube channel. And we're just nearing 100 episodes. I think we're on like number 98 or something like that. <clears throat> so you can watch all kinds of other videos with wonderful professionals like Dr. Hamilton on lots of topics. Lots of them include Lyme related illnesses and mold related illnesses and all these complex chronic conditions that both Dr. Hamilton and I see frequently and sadly are increasing from our environmental changes and from the, we were just talking before we got on here live about um, she used to live in my community and about the damage that's happened in Louisville and Superior and just how now the smoke and the wildfires, mm -hmm. I'm definitely becoming more aware of those environmental toxic things. So we'll probably touch just a little bit on that because it's related to the air quality and that's a huge environmental piece of the puzzle. Um, you can also find me on iTunes or Stitcher or anywhere you find uh, your podcasting and you can listen to all these episodes just audio there um, if you need any just free resources i've got loads and loads of articles at jillcarnahan.com and you can visit drjillhealth.com for products um, for full disclosure uh, dr w hamilton works for research nutritionals one of my very favorite uh, companies that provides nutritional support um, we're coming here with just great education for you but we may mention products because these are things that i actually use in my clinical practice and i told dr hamilton feel free to mention she She's actually formulated a lot of these products, and I really have the greatest respect, not only for her as a clinician, um, but also for just the fact that um, some of my favorite stuff that she's helped to formulate comes from Research Nutritional. So we might talk about that. You can find them. You can find more information at their website, uh, researchnutritionals.com, but you can also find um, the products on my website, uh, drjillhealth.com, and of course, I'll link up to those. So let me quickly introduce Dr. Hamilton, and then we will uh, jump right in. Um, Dr. Hamilton is a medical doctor with a master's of science in public health. She treats hundreds of children with autism and ADHD. She's triple board certified in pediatrics, integrative medicine, and physician nutrition. She attends events to speak about reversing. I've heard her speak all over. She's a wonderful <laughs> educator. And uh, like I said, just really what I love about you, Dr. Hamilton, is you have a humility and, and um, way of going about this that um, you certainly don't proclaim your own greatness, but you are amazing. And I really respect <laughs> Thank you, Jill. I appreciate I, that. I really do. Like I have the greatest respect, especially in these tough cases with children. You treat a lot of children. So yeah. let's start with, I told you, I love stories. So if you want to just share a little bit about how did you get into medicine? How did you get into, especially like autism, ADD, and your board certifications? Tell us a little bit about your journey to where you're at today. Right, your journey. Well, I am in medicine basically because I was born with a heart defect. Wow. And in a time where, you know, some of the heart surgery is really young, I mean, early. And I had a female pediatric cardiologist and I was like, oh, I wanted to be like her. Wow. And so <laughs> that's kind of because nobody in my family is in medicine or health or science or anything. So it's kind of a, but I've wanted to think, thought about my whole life. Um, so I made it research in nutrition and I did kind of my public health. And so I've always been interested in nutrition. Um, I had some of my own health problems and family issues, like most of us do, who get integrated medicine. I'm from Connecticut. I had Lyme disease, mm -hmm. and it went into rheumatoid arthritis. Wow. Um, and then I took one of the medicines and ended up with a salmonella infection in my blood and almost died. Wow. <laughs> so I was like, okay. Was this um, before medical school or during? Like what? This time? was actually after I had my child. So, you know, 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago. Um, and then I have family members. I have... Um, family members with a lot of learning issues on ADHD and dyslexia and sensory integration. And it was kind of like, you know, I used to joke that I kind of saw all the different kind of practitioners in Boulder, I'm like, oh, let's try acupuncture and let's try naturopathy. And so I just finally ended up at the um, AHMA meeting and I'm like, oh my God, there are doctors like me. I felt like I found my tribe. Yes. And so I took, like, okay, I'll just open a practice. <laughs> I, I love that. Deb. There. Yeah. And I love it. It's so often, I don't know any of the great doctors, you know, in our realm, in our world that haven't had a journey either personally or with loved ones where we've, right. we've got a great medical education. I always say, I, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact of my medical education and yours too, um, because mm -hmm. we have this great foundation in a system that does a lot of good in trauma and acute um, right. illness or heart attack. However, what we all come up against is these limitations of drugs and surgery. Right. And so right. there's a place for them, but then there's also places where there's huge limitations with um, chronic infections or um, psychiatric diagnosis, like you mentioned, or um, this right. complex 
um, basically, I always think of it as like the infectious burden and the toxic load. And right. there's a lot of talk about those two pieces of the puzzle. And really, unless you go deep and look at root cause, there's not a lot of solutions with drugs, right? I mean, they have their place, but it's not right. the answer and it's not usually the cure. So um, it sounds like your journey was very similar. So then did you choose pediatrics kind of based on your experience as a child and then go into- Absolutely. Yeah. I thought about family practice. Um, and then I realized that I really like kids and I really want to treat kids and especially the elderly. I'm like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> so it just kind of is a natural fit. And at one, thought, one point I thought, okay, I'll be a pediatric cardiologist. Yeah. Um, and then it, it just fit. And then basically I, I kind of came into and I did some kind of, holistic primary care and, you know, I had a practice in Boulder. So I'll, some of it came back and then I became much more of a consult. So now, now I really just do chronic kids yeah. and in the 17 years or 17 plus years of doing this, kids are getting sicker and sicker. I feel like we have much more, so much more in our environment yeah. that is really affecting these kids. And 20, you know, 20 years ago, you had a regressive autism and these kids will get, you know, you, there's a lot of kids you're like, okay, they recover, they get better. And I feel like Maybe it's the longer you practice, the harder kids you get or the harder patients, you know, people refer you some of the patients that are, the, you know, the most chronic, but I feel like, you know, and I hear that from my adult doctors too, that people are just getting sicker and sicker. You know, I could not agree things. more. Yeah. I remember back again, about 20 years ago when I started into integrative functional medicine and there'd be someone with hormone imbalance or Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Mm -hmm. And three months later, they were better. They didn't have to come back with <laughs> me. And now it's just over and over these very adults as well. But like you said, the children are really bearing the brunt. Let's talk just a little bit, because this is definitely going to be part of our conversation today. Um, environmental toxic load. Um, I agree. That's the elephant in the room. It is exponentially right. increasing the kinds of, we think the EPA is protecting us and mm -hmm. it's not testing every chemical. And the bigger thing is a lot of these are synergistic. So there's thousands of combinations of chemicals. And we know from the research, um, there's this biphasic curve where very low levels of synergistically chemicals can affect our hormones in a hormetic way that is not measurable in the toxicology literature, right? So there's these right. other completely different. Yeah. So talk a little bit about environmental toxic load and how you see it playing into your, like, especially with these children. With these children. Mm -hmm. The other thing that, you know, from a pediatrician standpoint is if you think about a baby, you know, baby's like what, seven, eight pounds. Mm -hmm. So if you think about just the exposure based on body weight, you know, so things can be so much more toxic or just their, you know, their detoxification pathways aren't mature, mm -hmm. right? So not able to handle as much. Yeah. So I think you have to think about then, and you're also developing, you're growing a brain, you know, you have this whole neurologic system. So you think about a lot of these chemicals aren't started study for neurotoxicity. Yeah. So I think, you know, that's added, or you think about the exposure of pregnant women, you know, babies in utero and their exposure, just yeah. and how that all adds up. And I think like 20 years ago out of Canada, there was a study on cord blood that showed 200 yes. plus chemicals. When a baby's born, they tested the cord blood and literally the babies are born with 200 plus chemicals. And this was two, two decades ago. So right. I can't imagine how much worse it is nowadays. Um, do you talk to, uh, do you ever talk to mother's preconception or? Um, I do. I don't know if you remember, but I did write a book, like kind of like looking at um, preventing the idea was I saw these healthy boulder moms. And then I saw my kids, with, you know, the chronic autism. And I was starting to look at the moms and their history and the moms were sick, Yeah, you know, and they all had autoimmune disease and asthma and all that other stuff. So I think preconception, I think preconception is very important. And I do talk to moms about that or pregnancy because you have to have a mom to be healthy. Yeah. You think about anything in her body is going to be transferred to the baby. Yeah. So let's talk for just a second. Say we were talking to those listening out there and they are thinking about having a family or maybe they had one child and they want several more. What kinds of things would you uh, uh, bring to their awareness on if they want to get pregnant and have a healthy baby? Uh, because you and I, I'm sure agree that during pregnancy, we don't want to detox a lot. No, absolutely right not. At all. Well, no, so that always frightens me. Right? Yeah, me too. So what would you tell a, a mother to be about environmental toxicity or what she could do uh, and engage? She could do. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the number one things I always talk about is organic foods. Yeah. Um, you know, especially the whole glyphosate. If you look at like the, how glyphosate levels have just increased and some of the rates of some of our diseases, including autism, celiac, all of this, Alzheimer's. So I think if you really, I kind of go back and go, you have to clean up your diet. You have to eat organic foods. Um, you need to check your levels, like what's your vitamin D level, what's your iron, you know, zinc, mm -hmm. I mean, what are you going into, you know, starting a really good prenatal and omega threes, um, then getting your gut in good shape, the whole microbiome, right? When the baby's born, 
they basically get all that good bacteria from the mom. So the mom has chronic IBS or problems and the baby's gonna start life with an abnormal microbiome essentially. And then all the toxicity, you know, what are you putting on your skin? What are you using to, to kill you know, <laughs> weeds in your garden, you know? But I really think about all those personal care products and like sunscreen and yeah. you know how much you absorb. So really kind of environment, gut and nutrition, essentially oh, great. You know, kind of the basics. Yeah, great, great things. I remember um, most of my listeners have heard I had breast cancer at 25. And so there's no doubt yeah. as I look back um, and, and I'm in the midst of writing my, my book, which is a lot about my history. I have my dad's chemical record. Yeah, I was, I grew up on a farm. So oh, um, I was about I had, to say, I know you're from the Midwest. <laughs> yeah, so farm. And literally we found his handwritten journal of the chemicals he used in the year I was born. And it reads like a, a pendium of the toxic endocrine disruptors. And for those of you listening, wow. endocrine disruptors means they have hormone-like effects on the body. So for someone like a young woman, breast cancer risk is definitely affected. Those breast cells get stimulated by chemicals that look look like estrogen to the body. And for me, I literally like, um, atrazine was on there and there was, oh, so, wow. yeah, it was a form of atrazine, which is, you know, absolutely a massive toxic chemical. <laughs> it's very toxic. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I've had moms who've, um, had really severe pesticide exposure and had kids with autism. We really couldn't look, couldn't really find other things. A lot yeah. of infertility, you know, you're right. Kind of the hormonal effects, same yeah. thing. And you think about 25 year olds, breast cancer, those cells started to do weird things probably at 15 or 10, like years before. And I have, really, yeah, totally. Yeah. Right. Probably when well, I think like, I risk. Probably, exactly. I probably had exposure in utero. Like there's, I don't have evidence, but I just, it's very likely that I probably had, and it's who knows, but either way, it's interesting to learn because then we can talk to moms and, and those kinds of things. So I love that you started with organic food because a lot of this <laughs> is yes. um, from pesticides in our food supply. Um, I was just reading an article today from the Denver Post about PFAOs. Is that um, mm -hmm. the Teflon, basically? Um, right. yeah. water supply. So these are basically permanent. They're called forever chemicals. They don't break down. Right. And mm -hmm. um, and some of the companies, I won't mention any names, but they were <laughs> yeah. bought dumping these um, uh, things in our water supply. And, and with the drought, it's actually like they're finding traces and it's hard to get rid of. They're very hard to get rid of. I mean, so when you mentioned that environmental working group study, yeah. they found chemicals in baby's cord blood that hadn't been produced in like 20 years. Wow. And they were still, you know, so they weren't even actively used anymore, but they're still in much of an environment that moms are carrying them and transmitting the babies. That always struck with me like, oh my gosh, like, you can't, you're right. You can't get rid of these. Yeah. Like Agent Orange is some of those way, way old chemicals that um, uh, DDT and stuff that are really not around. They're still in our environment. Maybe talk a little bit about for our listeners of what are these like persistent organic, what does that mean? Because that's a big piece of the puzzle of the persistence of the persistence. Mm -hmm. well, I always think of um, some of the persistent ones. I mean, some of the hormonal things, but I think, you know, they get into our fats, Yeah. you know, and our fat cells and they're kind of stored there. Um, and, uh, you know, if you think about heavy metals and like lead in the bones and stuff, so our body, I feel like our body can only get rid of as much as it can. And that, that varies by individual. And so what it can't get rid of, it tries to store away from circulation. In some ways, I think it's trying to protect us yeah. by storing it. But then you still have, you know, ongoing effects from it because you're still in your system. You have still have it in your body. Yeah, that kind of, I mean, that's how I that's think about it. Perfect. Cause yeah. And basically the ways let's talk a little about, like, let's say you do think you have a toxic load, which honestly we all do. I think we, I know. I agree. We all do. Right. Absolutely. We all do. Like to some extent, um, I'll give just a personal example. Um, last year I had a little bit more mold exposure with a friend. And um, so I've been detoxifying it. I'm in good mm -hmm. shape now, but what I noticed year, just a year ago, I would do sauna, no problem, 30 minutes, pretty high temperature. Now, if I do it, I think my loads up a little, because when I do sauna or any sort of Thing where I'm pushing detox, um, I will feel really kind of tired and not well unless I take the binders right away and way right, more. Yeah. Do. So, and what happens with those is we're basically um, sweating and excreting them from the tissues and they can actually go into our bloodstream before our uh, kidneys and our lungs and our liver really excrete them out of the body through the stool and the urine and the sweat. Right. So for my case, uh, for my example, I was probably, you know, mobilizing them and yet not excreting them as fast as I needed to. And I didn't feel well. Right. I mean, basically like a die off, we consider like that mm -hmm. die off reaction, you know, your body can't get rid of it. You yeah. know what we see with a lot of our patients because their detoxification pathways aren't that good. Yeah. Which is why some people, we can all be exposed to the same thing. And some people are really sick and some people are not. Yeah. Or not as sick or they don't, or not yet, maybe. <laughs> right. They may be right. <laughs> uh. So well, I think about, oh, 
Oh, no, no. That's what I think about. You say about the toxic load, like a toxic mm -hmm. load in one person, you know, they can tolerate it. You know, the people who are 90 and still smoke cigarettes and then, <laughs> but that's not the most of us, right? So, yeah. So genetics play a lot into this, like you said, and that's why some children develop autism or ADD or other symptoms or for me, adults that develop autoimmunity or more gut issues or neurocognitive issues or early dementia. A lot of times those are the canaries. Those are the ones that are much more susceptible. I'm one of those. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's almost like we talk about a bucket. I'm sure you talk about this with your patients as well. Mm -hmm. It's almost like we're all born with a capacity to talks like a bucket and we all have different size buckets. And when that bucket starts to fill up over our lifetime, um, it starts to spill over the top with disease and illness. And some of us have smaller containers so that it doesn't take as much for us to overload and spill over the top. And we'll switch to next some of the things we can do about this. But one of the ways um, that we, we decrease load is if we can decrease that um, load in the bucket and lower the water level, all of a sudden we create margin. And once we have margin, we can function and we can, because our bodies are made to detox. Like we are right. created as detox detox organisms, if we just help and assist in bringing that level down. Um, let's talk about things that you, some of your favorite ways, say you have a child with autism that has a toxic load. First of all, maybe testing. Do you test it? Right. Yeah. Um, you know, in some ways, like you said there, you know, sometimes you just kind of assume, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I do good. have done, definitely done different urine panels, um, you know, for mold, mycotoxin panels, urine panels, because obviously in a child, urine is easier to get than blood. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I do, you know, and it's also, you know, I always start, if you start, like, I always, you know, like I've been telling you, you start with nutrition and start with allergies and treat the gut, you know, and then kind of look into the mold and the mm -hmm. chronic infections and the toxins. So it's kind of as I go along, mm -hmm. um, but do look at it, but I've never, when I've done the tests, I've never found anyone who doesn't have some yeah. kind of toxin burden. So I feel like, you know, is that right? Um, and I also look at heavy metals. Yeah, you know, and I do challenge tests and hair tests and all that stuff. And I find a lot of that also done in myself. You know, I grew yes. up eating seafood on the East Coast. I have mercury, yeah. you know, I just do <laughs> grew up in old houses. I have lead. Yes. You know? So I love um, that you said that because that's the truth too. No matter who I test, including myself, I've never gotten a test that has no toxin at all. Like I just, you no. don't see it, right? So we know we're all swimming in this toxic soup. And it's almost like, like you said in the beginning, I love that you talked about just clean diet, organic diet. Mm -hmm. I always talk about clean air. I'm sure you do as well. Like how are we, right? right. <laughs> water, water, yeah. Clean air, clean food, because sometimes it gets overwhelming to either doctors or patients and like, okay, what do we do? There's like 10,000 toxins in the environment and this toxic load. And it, it can feel overwhelming, not only to the patient, but to the clinician. And I would just think, gosh, let's start simple. Like you said, I loved you start with just eating clean because a lot mm -hmm. of it has to do with what you put in your body. And if you can keep that in a good space, like you're eating organic, you have air filters in your home and workplace or wherever you sleep at least, and you're um, drinking clean water, just that alone is a huge thing to decrease burden. And then granted, there's other protocols that are more complex to detoxify, but if you're limiting what comes in your body, that's a great way to start. And it's that's not hard to start. And with, you know, with my population, with kids with autism, with sensory issues and eating issues, yes. that's not always as simple as you can think. Yes. I, mean, I have kids who come to me, I'm like, you eat five foods. Right. And they're all white. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, you know, and, and you really have to look at things and the organic and, um, but as I said, you, you can't get around that. Yeah. Um, and the parents who, who really can make diet changes and really kind of clean up the kid's diet, even if it's five healthier foods you know, these kids do well, or what I said, what do you put on your skin too? You know, you can yes. absorb that. Um, so as I said, I always trying to start with the basics, start with the gut, because I want to make sure that they're absorbing their food, you know, if you're giving them good food. And also if you're kind of cleaning up their system, at least to start, hopefully they'll start to naturally detoxify. Um, I do do use glutathione. Um, I use things that do support the liver and kidneys. Um, glutathione is kind of one of my big ones. Yeah, the first visit I probably don't because I don't know all of it. And let's mention products. briefly because your the research nutritionist has a great product. Um, we've could have found that the best thing is a taste, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> I wish I had that one, but I didn't. But we do have taste tests in the office. Yeah. So Triportify, um, it's called Triportify Lipsyma Glutathione. Um, it looks like one of the the containers look like it's a suntan lotion, but it's yeah. not. <laughs> but there's watermelon orange and glutathione is a sulfur based compound. And so it really doesn't taste good, um, but you need it in some kind of form that your body absorbs. Liposomes have the fat, mm -hmm. um, but watermelon orange and watermelon tastes, you know, maybe I'll age myself, but a Jolly Rancher candy, honestly. And so I've been able to get that in. And there's other glutathione that I literally couldn't get in the kids. Yeah. So this is, 
And sometimes you can mix other stuff in it because it's sweet. So open up some of the other supplements and mix it, you know, to get that in kids also. That's one thing I love. And if you saw me looking around, just making sure if you're listening live here, I'm going to put the link there so you guys can see what this is. So I was putting that in our chat box and you can share. Yeah, it. oh, good. Okay. Yeah. So that's there. And then, um, like you said, watermelon, uh, people love that. I always say it tastes like watermelon jelly rancher. <laughs> right? that's, yeah, that's exactly. I was going to say, I, it's a little sweet for me. I prefer the orange, but the kids yeah. in general always start with the watermelon because that seems yeah. to, to work the best. And so. like you said, this uh, glutathione by nature has kind of a bitter, not, you know, sulfur based. So any of those things that's, is not very tasty. It's hard to hide it and I don't know of anyone else on the market that has a better tasting product <laughs> I haven't I have not seen one either yeah. and I said I've had kids and I've tried everyone <laughs> yeah yeah so it, it makes a difference so. so that's a great place to start um I want to talk about mold specifically in a minute because you've got some yeah. really unique new things but um talk about like a general detox you said liver support is there anything specifically besides like milk thistle or any what would you use um I mean I always think of glutathione mm -hmm. I do and I have used kind of what I call drainage formulas yeah really in terms of like kidney and liver and lymph mm -hmm. and those are easy you know the ones i've used are um you can kind of like just do a few drops in terms mm -hmm. of kids um again you know i want to make sure that their uh, their you know their vitamin d status is good and they've got you know good immune response i see a lot of low zinc so and i was kind of trained into research in zinc um and That's kind of, I think about it like metals, that. Isn't it? the zinc and magnesium for the metals is so critical and so many patients are right right Right. And those are the number ones. I mean, I use zinc and magnesium all the time in my kids. Um, and as I said, I usually do, I do want to get them in a healthier state because if they already have poor detoxification and all of a sudden you, in my, what I've seen in my kids is if you start and detox them right away, you're going to make them sick. Yes. If their body, you know, you have to literally open up their pathways. I also think about, you know, getting inflammation down and glutathione's also for oxidative stress. It's all well, those free radicals that, I think of them like, like attacking tissue, you know, like apples turn brown, right? It's kind of yes. rusting. Yes. And so really kind of getting inflammation down, um, getting oxidative stress down, um, kind of in some ways getting them ready to detox so their bodies are as strong as they can be in order to detox. One so, thing you mentioned with kids in autism is they have the PON1, so yes. they can't detoxify pesticides very well. So oh. I think pesticides are worse for them. And that's good. Yes. Like they've done studies on it and show it's pretty mm -hmm. high. And I've seen that. So let's talk great. So that's a gene you're talking about PON one. And I know yeah. I have one of those two, which again, farm. Oh, pepper. really? Yeah. So like uh, we're talking about mutations, oh. but you're saying that children in general, even if they have no mutations in that gene, that doesn't function as well. Is that what you're saying? Oh, no, they just more, they have the genes, but my guess is they don't, doesn't function well either. Got it. Like you know, we have to think about yes. these are not small adults. Yes. Right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Now you mentioned inflammation. And again, there's two products in your line that I love um, so much. And I want you to talk a little bit about Histoquel and Cytoquel. Oh, yeah. Great um, Tell me I can't bit. take a credit for Cytoquel, but we are, we did do a study on um, in inflammation and Cytoquel is a combination of curcumin, you know, mm -hmm. in a highly absorbable form, resveratrol, EGCG NAC and acetylcysteine. Um, and it does, as I said, we did have a study that showed that it decreased pain mm -hmm. in people and we had cooled chronic pain and inflammation and also even some of the like fibrin. Yeah. So it actually had some like wow. effective on Willebrand factor, um, and fibrin. So actually in terms of like, I think inflammation and even vessel health decreased blood pressure. Wow. So I think of it also as kind of cardiac support, um, as along with anti-inflammatories and histoquel, I, I said, I did help develop that. Yeah. Um, in terms of mast cells, um, and half of it is something, you know, flavonoids like quercetin, people know. Yeah. And again, a form of quercetin that you can really absorb better, right? Because a lot of times, if, if people just take random herbs, you don't always absorb Yeah, turmeric and uh, human in general, they're not bioavailable unless you put no. them with a uh, liposome or something that helps enhance absorption, right? Right. And exactly. I said quercetin in the same way. And so if all of a sudden, you know, people are like, oh, I'm taking something, it doesn't work. You've got to really, that's what, the more I've learned about it is you really have to take stuff that is high quality and the right doses and the right combinations or doesn't work. Yeah. You know, and then people are like, oh, well, it doesn't work. And I'm like, no, it does, but you have to it take does, it. It does, but you're maybe I shouldn't mention any retailers that are on the corner stores, but they don't, they don't have as good. So basically right. really quick here, there's professional grade, like the company you work for and others that right. we use, and then there's supplement grade and there's a really big difference in quality. So you want to make sure you're getting that professional grade, either from a pharmacy or physician or some reputable company, some of them direct to consumer. Now it doesn't have to be through a doctor, but the, right. the quality yeah. really does matter. Um, and I love that you mentioned um, a couple of things. Histoquel, I love um, 
uh, for the mast cell kinds of stuff, like you said. Right. And what we're seeing, you mentioned this earlier, but you almost have to do it in order. You have to calm the mast cells and calm that inflammation often before you do heavy detox. So right. say yeah. someone has mold related illness, you have to really make sure that mast cell histamine component is under control because otherwise they'll react to your treatment protocols. And that histoquel right. is really, really good for that. And that'd be like, even something like heartburn could be histamine related, often the congestion, the sneezing, the itchy eyes, the skin rashes, um, eczema, allergies, atopic stuff. Um, and then gut, gut permeability is driven by histamine. Yes. So a lot of kids will have this massively permeable gut. And until you calm that histamine response, you can't really do much for the gut, right? Right, because then they, re as you said, they react to herbs, they react yeah. to everything. And you're right, and you don't get anywhere. And these are the really sensitive patients. So yeah, well, I love it. I started there. <laughs> yeah. <Right. laughs> well, as I said, you know, you kind of, you do, you have to calm the system down so it doesn't react to treatment, but also so, you know, people feel better and, and kind of get better. But it is a step-by-step. -step. Um, the other thing about histoquel is it does have other flavonoids like luteolin and perilla. Um, oh, love perilla. Or perilla, <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and when I make a product, what I do is I literally go and I go ingredient by ingredient. And I look at the research. Well, what is the research on quercetin mm -hmm. that for mast cells and allergies and eczema and atopic disease? And, and perilla is one that I you know, didn't know about before. And I kind of looked into this. I'm like, oh, and then luteolin and the combination of quercetin and luteolin has been studied a lot yeah. in autism. And then thinking about you know, mast cells bind to, or when they release histamine, histamine binds to receptors. Mm -hmm. And so- you know, what do we do if, you know, you think about antihistamines like Benadryl, well, what are our natural histamine blockers? So think about the stinging nettles mm -hmm. and yeah. that's kind of like a histamine blocker. So I thought, okay, well, if we can kind of block some of the histamine mm -hmm. and do things that the flavonoids basically inhibit the mast cells from releasing their mediators, histamine, and even, you know, a lot of other inflammation markers. Yeah. So that was kind of the goal behind it. And so it's nice to hear that. Uh, it is wonderful. And I love it. Because like you said, with if we think about medications, we have mast cell, um, you know, blockers, mast cell stabilizers, that would be like Singular or Montsilucast or Ketodafin. Mm -hmm. Those are often used in clinical practice. And then we have the, the H1, H2 blockers like Xantec and Zyrtec and Allegra and Claritin and those on that end and Benadryl. And right. this is like a natural product that tries to combine all of the different pieces of that, which again, I love that because we kind of need both pieces. The mast cell is upstream. So if we can stop them from right. blowing up, right. Then right. So we can, otherwise we're mopping up the histamine afterwards, which can be helpful. But yeah, <laughs> but yeah you, but you, yes. It's like allergies. It's like, if you want to treat somebody with seasonal allergies, you start ahead of time. Yes. So prevent everything from going yeah. on. And then the idea, what? No, go oh, ahead. I just say the idea behind our products is, is like, we want multiple mechanism action. I mean, we really think about what are the mechanisms of action here? What, how do mast cells cause issues and how can we, you know, what ways can you treat that? So it's really kind of based on that. And our products are like, okay, you know, there's a problem with mitochondria, there's a problem with mast cells. What are the ways we can target it? And what does the research show? Yes, yes. And again, they're really well thought out. I want to just briefly talk about cytokol because of course we just got through a pandemic that's all about cytokines. And yes. so I feel like this is one of those things that's been really helpful either during or post viral infection um, mm -hmm. uh, to calm that cytokine response. And especially even some of the long COVID kinds of patients that have this right perpetual cytokine. And that's common, not just to this virus we've been talking about, but to other viruses, other infections, Lyme disease, co-infections, et cetera. And it really does that cytokine response is almost like a runaway train. When the body starts to do this, it's a vicious cycle. And unless we block or stop that cytokine response, it might be the virus or the infection or the Lyme or the co is long gone. It's not always an active, but that, that body's ability to go crazy with the inflammation. This is one of those things that's really hard to treat in the cytokine and those kinds of things. What's in the cytoquel? You mentioned two more. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, curcumin and kind of the form, um, yeah. resveratrol, EG, CG, toco tocotrienols. Oh yes. So kind of for the more active um, kind of vitamin E and acetylcysteine. Awesome. And then mold. So one thing <laughs> I love is there's so many companies that do not have, we, we know everyday, buy, you know, charcoal, you can get over the counter. That's great. I love charcoal, but I feel like um, mold and toxins and binders are so key. Maybe start first. Right. Why do we need binders? Why is the gut a critical place for this to happen? And I definitely want to talk a bit about toxin pole and micro pole because they're fairly new and they're right. well thought out and we're loving these. <laughs> so that's oh, good. That's great to hear. <laughs> Um, well, I think with the binders is your body's naturally trying to get rid of things, right? Mm -hmm. As you said, so through the GI system is a major issue. The problem with the GI system 
is it, it basically it's kind of derived to it's designed to like save bile right it's designed mm -hmm. to kind of um i think it's yeah. like a saving thing but kind of not get rid of resources and mm -hmm. so it reabsorbs things so the body's like okay i'll get rid of that mycotoxin and it's bound to bile and then it's reabsorbed in the body it's like oh i need that bile so yes. what the binder does is it basically displaces that mycotoxin, binds a mycotoxin, so it's not reabsorbed and it's taken out of the body. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's kind of how I think about it. And our exactly. hepatic circulation. <laughs> in other words, I always say it's like a miracle round and it works really well. And you have to kind of grab it outside of that cycle and pull it out through the stool. And we right. do a lot of, our bile is made to absorb both the cholesterol and reuse it, but also toxins. It is a reservoir for toxins. And right. if we don't interrupt that with a binder that has a charge that kind of grabs on and escorts it out of the body, it's just recycling, recycling, really efficient, but we're not getting it out of the body, which is what you were mentioning. Right. As I said, your body trying but you're right it's also designed to preserve resources essentially um so tell us um, the difference between toxin pool and, and myco pool michael like uh, is more mold well, related, but those yeah are Michael. i mean mycotoxin was definitely designed for specifically mold the mycotoxins um and again it, it was when i looked at it it was like well what there's different kinds of mycotoxins mm -hmm. right there's more different kinds of molds so yeah. different mycotoxins bind to different binders you know so some yeah. are like have more affinity right and so the idea was like, well, how can we look at what are the major mycotoxins and what are the binders that are best for them? And then the other idea of the mycopol um, was, you know, a lot of these binders are from like the soil and the dirt and everything else. And there could be toxins in there. Yes. So you wanna make sure your binders are, don't have toxins also. So we wanted to make sure, you know, we clean products and there weren't extra lead and all the other stuff. Um, and I actually talked to some different mold, different doctors treat mold, say, hey, you know, <laughs> one time I was like, if I built a, a mold binder, I'd want this and this and this. And so, yeah. like, you know, and then we looked in this and like, and that was really how we kind of looked at that. Um, toxin pull was designed more, it's partly, you know, it's a kind of an update of another product that was designed for heavy metals. Okay. And really looking at the pesticides and specifically glyphosate you know, how do you get rid of some of these? Yeah. And there is some different ingredients and humic acid, folic acid, which is in both, mm -hmm. actually has research about binding the glyphosate they use it in agriculture yeah. to get, you know, to protect the animals. So we kind of looked at some of the ingredients that, well, if you're trying to get a detox, what can you, can you there's ingredients to support the liver, there's ingredients to support the kidneys, um, you know, like looking at the research for glyphosate and then heavy metals and then, um, you know, thinking about aluminum is a huge issue. You know, it's, yeah. it's in vaccines, yeah. it's in deodorants, it's in a lot of things. So for, uh, I want to stop really quick, clinicians, if you're listening or patients, if your doctor yeah. can check your aluminum level, you can check whole blood aluminum fairly easily on any lab. Um, and of course, urine excretion is all great. But if you want a quick and easy way to kind of check a, a acute level, it's really worth checking. Um, I have seen a lot of people with high aluminum levels, and it's not it's not even in the common like five metal panel on lab course. So it's something that you <laughs> write in, but it's super important. And I feel like it's I'm seeing a lot more aluminum toxicity. And we know it relates to dementia, Alzheimer's and brain. It accumulates mm -hmm. in the brain. So I love that you mentioned that. Yeah, aluminum is actually, I see that a lot and I've seen it on hair tests. I've seen it on um, a lot of different, you're right, different testing. Um, and our kids are exposed and it is a neurotoxin. Yes. And the other thing about it is, is if you have it with glyphosate, glyphosate damages the gut and it actually helps the aluminum pull into the system. Wow. Which is how I think it actually increases the issues of the Alzheimer's. Yes. And in, in a lot of ways, autism is, is has a lot of the same neuroinflammation as patients with Alzheimer's if you really want to it's very parallel in a way, isn't it? It's like brain inflammation on all stages of life. <laughs> yep. Which yeah. I think is really frightening. You think yeah. about some of your early stage of life and how much neuroinflammation they have. Mm -hmm. So oh. I, like quick, layers. <laughs> exactly. A quick funny story about the toxin pool. So when um, we first talked to uh, your company about the newer products, and this was maybe six months or so ago, literally maybe the next day, my brother, who's uh, still farming, um, called me or texted me and said, hey, Jill, I just had a massive, you know, the tank of chemical dumped on me. Now they're mostly oh organic gosh. and they're all GM, non-GMO, but they still use some chemicals. And, and some, once in a while they have a spill. And I literally, he's like, what should I do? And I literally, in that day, that meal, I got a sample the toxin pool I'm like take this <laughs> now <Yeah. laughs> so I like sent it right off to my brother <laughs> yeah that's great that's great yeah. um and the other thing if like in terms of like toxin pool when I detox people I use glutathione also yes 
like I, you know, I, I, it's like they just go together in my book. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. a great point because if you have a binder and you're not really pushing the toxins, that doesn't do any good. And if you push the toxins, you need something like a mop or a sponge to kind right. of help the body. So that's a great, great um, point. And then if we are using glutathione, we need the binders and vice versa. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then, as you said before, like I don't detox pregnant women. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. Do not detox because you're going to just, put it here. but if you can get a woman before, you know, six months, a year before, and really do a good detox, think about going into pregnancy in such a healthier yeah. state. Absolutely. So. Um, let's talk a little bit about one other thing that I really love that you guys have is um, formulas for mitochondria. And there's some of my right. favorite ones, right? Do you want to talk yeah. to about some of your favorites stuff for the energy kind of stuff, the ATP? Yeah. Um, well, ATP 360, mm -hmm. I said, I did help. Um, we had an ATP fuel and there's research on that. And, and then the ATP 360 um, is, the, is the kind of the next one. And we do have research on that in terms of, you know, helping fatigue, so clinical symptoms and also helping mitochondria. Um, and it's great because I've been treating mitochondria. That's a dysfunction. That's a huge issue. in in a lot of people, a lot of kids and adults, and it's always like, oh, I want this ingredient. Or I want this ingredient. And, you know, and you kind of, you know, put here and there, and there's some other formulas that were never that I saw complete. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, PQQ, we learn more about that. And we know, and it, you know, some NAD and, you know, CoQ10 and carnitine, but also all those cofactors, all those B vitamins, you know, yeah. And so we're able to kind of put it together and then do research on it. Um, so as I said, that's the one that, that. And I love it. It's my kind of go-to with someone saying, I'm really tired. I'm not, right. I might have all the other things going on, but I know yeah. that mitochondria is key. And I know I want carnit, like you said, carnitine and NAD and the B vitamins. And what's great about that is it kind of has everything in one. It makes it really easy to give them. Here's a product, try this. And yeah. I really see both, um, both of the ATP products. Um, I, I see really good results with people. People come back and say, I feel better, more energy. So love those. Um, yeah. And the phospholipids, I almost forgot the phospholipids. If you think about the mitochondrial membrane is actually made of phospholipids, like yes. even though phosphatidylcholine. And so part of the mitochondria not working is having that cell membrane damaged. Yes. And that's where some of the, you know, the final energy production is. So getting those phospholipids too. So that's kind of another, yeah. you know, multi-mechanism. <laughs> you know, that's I do it again. So key. So. The phospholipids really for mold, especially too, both mold, mold and chronic inflammation, infection, all these things we're talking mm -hmm. about. Let's shift just a little because I know you and I both sadly see more and more cases of tick borne infections yes. and <laughs> infections in general. And I would say infections in general, like I said at the beginning, toxic load infectious burden is at the core of almost all the chronic complex patients that Dr. Hamilton and I see. So we have to deal with the toxic load for sure, but often because the toxic load weakens immune system, these underlying infections, it could be Epstein-Barr, CMV, herpetic viruses of all types right. and Lyme like Borrelia, Bartonella, Babesia. So what I want to talk about is I mentioned this before our car blood, I just started using a, a, a couple of products for my Lyme patients, especially the more maybe not complex ones and I've had good results. Um, one of them is a liquid tincture called BLT. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Right. And, and that, uh, like I said, I've had really good uh, results. And then microbinate, did you help develop microbinate? No, these are microbinate. It's kind of like the more general antimicrobial and that's in capsules. Got it. Um, and then I said some of the tinctures and we actually have, now we just have a yeast tincture that came out, a limicant oh, that yes. I have developed. And we have a McP, which is mycoplasma. But if you look at ingredients, it's great for Bartonella. I love Mike P. I have my, yes, for, my I'll tell you, because I see these mycoplasmas, IgM, IgG or whatever, or these chronic, but, and again, if you have a uh, Lyme or co-infections, almost 90 or more percent of patients with that also have mycoplasma or chlamydia pneumonia, which are tip atypicals. They often reside in the lungs. They typically start mm -hmm. with an atypical pneumonia and these are tough and they can really contribute to chronic fatigue. Right. Right. Um, so I love my one, two punch for mycoplasma is that Mike P drops mm -hmm. and then the transfer factor, um, the plasmic, yes, plasmic, <laughs> right. Yeah. I love those two products. Let's talk transfer factors. I almost forgot. Yeah. Well, the, the other thing just before, like the MCP and the plasmic, those are my go-to for pans pandas. Oh, right? it's because it's coverage. The, yeah. Yeah. Cause the plasmic covers, it covers Borrelia, mm -hmm. but it covers mycoplasma, covers staph, mm -hmm. strep, EBV, wow. a lot of the viruses and candida. Oh, amazing. Yeah. I have so, real success with it. So, <laughs> yeah. So that's like my endemic P as I said, you know, a lot of these kids have multiple infections because their immune system mm -hmm. isn't working. And so they have all these different infections, but that's, so sometimes it's hard to figure out what they're reacting to, yeah. but that to me has been some of my best combinations. And I use the multi, multi-immune too, the general transfer yes. factors also. Yes. So I use both of those. 
So transfer factors, let's talk just because you guys have all kinds of transfer factors. Yeah. And you're, that's very unique about the company and they're super helpful because what we just talked about is these things that weaken immune system. So we right. want to fight the infection with some of these herbal formulas, but one of the other things we need to do is how do we support that immune system? Because that immune system, if it kicks in, sometimes the patients don't need forever treatment if their immune system gets back on track, right? right. It's like you're getting their nature back so they can actually, their body actually works the way it should. So the way I describe transfer factors is a lot of people know that, you know, immune cell B cells make antibodies, right? And that's what we kind of measure. And that's one of our immune system, but T cells make transfer factors and they're very, they're like small little antibodies, but for the different part of the immune system. So yes. they actually, you know, our immune system was designed that way. Um, and they're really good in terms of kind of the, the T cells that really help fight viruses and co so that like first line infection. Mm -hmm. And they help increase natural killer cells, which is also one of our first line infections for viruses. And a lot of people, their immune system is imbalanced and they can't fight these infections. Yeah. So transfer factors are great at getting the immune system up so the, the person can fight infections. Um, they're even good kind of acutely and you can really dose them up. Like there's the, we have the multi-immune, mm -hmm. which also has colostrum and mushrooms and astragalus and all sorts of different um, you know, ingredients. And for acute infections, three, three times a day, it's amazing. You can really kind of get through a cold, but chronically for three, and we do have research that shows that it increases lymphocytes, both B and T cells and increases natural killer cells. And um, it even has some modulating effects, you know, increasing, you know, interleukin 10, which is kind of helps balance our immune system. So nice. that, that's actually one of my kind of basics too, um, yeah. just in terms of getting immune system and then doing what we could plasmic, the targeted ones, yeah. which are very specific for infections. Yeah, so the plasmic is more that mycoplasma, but like you said, it covers a broad range. And then there's the L plus, is that right? The right. one yep. more L plus. Yeah, love that one as well. And I'm actually using that one for a reactivation of Epstein-Barr as well. Um, yeah. And we see that uh, there's a lot of research now that's showing um, in the pandemic, we've had a lot more reactivation of Epstein-Barr. So I think a lot of patients who are suffering after maybe being infected um, are having reactivation of old viruses. Yeah, and Lyme. I think yes. activation of Lyme too. But yeah, a lot of Epstein-Barr. And that's my go-to combination, the plasmic. And I dose that high, mm -hmm. right? If somebody's, you know, it's yeah. two capsules a day, but I actually, I dose that higher. And like I use four. the whole thing I've used both together. Beautiful. So would you do like yeah. four a day or six a day of the um, plasmic, the, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, the, yeah, the the multi-immune I've gone up to nine day, a day oh. kind of acutely. Yeah. Um, the plasmic, you know, it also helps for, um, you know, herpes, mm -hmm. you know, people get cold sores. Yeah. So yeah, up to six a day, easy. Ah, fantastic. Great. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is so fun. Cause like I said, I really do love that. Um, any other tips or tricks? So we talked about detox and we talked about yep. some of things there and some of the latest and greatest. And that's really, a, I, and we actually started with MCAS and mast cell and mm -hmm. histamine. Then we went into detox now more than <laughs> a lot and, of things, right? Yeah. We really covered um, anything else that you've seen in clinical practice or that you feel like we maybe haven't touched on um, um, in terms of um, I said, I have, we have that, you know, candida overgrowth is very common. Um, that's a good know, in the gut. So huge, so, yeah. Right. So the limican, um, and I, I said cinnamon and clove and berberine, and um, we didn't realize how powerful it was. But like you got to start slowly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I think that 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 is something that we just came out with. We do have some brain formulas, the BDNF essentials, really kind of targeting. And I made it so it was a calming formula. So I made sure there's no ingredients that. Yeah you know, people could have an adverse reaction to or get <laughs> agitated with. Um, so really great for ADHD, um, very calming, um, had some good, good success with it for people post concussions. Wow. Mm, that's so, great. Yeah. Because the BDNF is one of the growth factors that helps after sort of brain you know, damage or concussion. Any kind of brain damage, right. So mm -hmm. autism, ADHD, but you know, Alzheimer's, you know, even that, you know, as you get older, like, what's that word again? You know, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. The word. <laughs> Oh, well, this is fantastic. You are such a wealth of knowledge um, for us and so appreciate it. And again, it was fun because we, you were in Boulder and you're still mm -hmm. mostly in California, you're taking new patients in California and Colorado. Tell us a little bit about your practice. Um, you know, I said I was in Colorado for a long term um, mm -hmm. and then came to California, but still go back once a month and see patients. Um, I'm not, I have a license in California, but I haven't seen anybody in person. I don't have an office. Okay. Here. Got but it. I am doing telemedicine. I do definitely do that too. Um, so you one know. benefit of COVID. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Better access. <laughs> yeah. So that's good. 
Fantastic. Um, and where can people find you? Do you have a website or a page they can visit? To? Um, I said usually by email. I do have a website that's being um, kind of updated. Okay. So in terms of research nutritionals, my email is dhamilton at researchnutritionals.com or it's Dr. Debbie and Debbie with a Y at holisticpediatric.com. So those are the best way to, to reach me. Mm, fantastic. Thank you so much for your time and your wealth of knowledge. And most of all, you're giving tools to us like myself, practitioners in the trenches. And I know you're using them too, but I have a lot of appreciation just because I can't do what I do without formulas from companies like Research Nutritionals and others, um, because those are really some of the tools in our toolbox. So thank you for all the work you do on every level. We okay. are so grateful. Well, thank you. You know, Jill, I, it's always great to talk to you. I always learn something from you and love hearing you speak. And I'm actually going to see you in a couple of days at a conference. So that'll be nice. Yes. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. But yeah, I appreciate talking to you. It's always, like I said, always a pleasure. So thank, thank you. you.